Uh, okay, Dan, um, uh, Half Plus Seven is your debut novel. Uh, when did you decide you wanted to be an author? Um, I think in my pr memory, I always wanted to be an author. It's kind of the answer that I would like to give if I had a very good PR man behind me. But I don't think that's exactly true. I think that I always wanted to be a footballer and thought that I would be the captain of Cardiff City and take the penalties in the corners and uh, kind of you know, make decisions about which substitutes we were going to bring on, uh, as opposed to being an author. Um, but writing was always something that, that was a big passion of mine, and, and reading, so kind of from from being a kid, I'm, I'm writing storybooks and memorizing at the age of three years old, uh, kind of 45 page Postman Pat book, uh, just kind of by memory. Uh, I, th I think my mum always knew that you know books books were my thing, and um, I'd always kind of done writing alongside PR, kind of feature stuff for, for journalism. Um, music mags, that that type of thing, and, and it just kind of led led there really. And I, I don't know whether it was almost a reaction against the kind of writing I was doing in PR, where um, you know you're trying to get your three key messages across, or you're writing for a very a very specific audience, one hour, and you know the next hour you're writing for a trade magazine, and the next the next minute you're writing. Uh, for an online forum, and then the next minute you're writing for the FT, and it always felt like, and still feels, because obviously, you know, not obviously, I, I still, I still work in VR. Um, it often feels like you're kind of writing to someone else's rules, um, and I think as I as I kind of went through my twenties, um, this, this it just kind of happened, really. It kind of happened. And, and the book um, is called Half Plus Seven. Um, without spoilers, give us a bit of a premise and tell us what it's about. Yeah. Um, so I like to think, or what I what I kind of set out to write, and what I wanted to do was to write um, a tale of redemption for my generation, so millennials or, or Generation Y, kind of taking inspiration from Douglas Coupland's uh, kind of quite famous novel. Uh, Generation X from from the from the 80s, and I kind of felt that really really very <laughs> in Cardiff. Uh, I, I kind of felt that uh, it was a generation that needed saving from itself. Really, that we hadn't had to. Uh, I'm speaking generalizing here, obviously, because there are ex there are always extreme extremes in every generation, but that we hadn't. My experience, or you know, the experience of the majority wasn't our kids dying from scurvy, wasn't um, you know, struggling to be able to put food on the table. It was you know, wondering what, which city break you were going to go on to or being pissed off because you didn't have Wi-Fi connection or you know, spending more than your dad would earn on a building site in Starbucks each week. And, and, and always generally being um, not the happiest as well. Um, and kind of having this, this kind of just being beset by choice everywhere we went, and that the choice was almost getting us down a little bit. And and I saw lots of unhappy people ar around me when, really, you know, if you kind of, I just have to close the, the door because <laughs> there's going to be flooding yeah. out. <laughs> it's live. So while I, while I talk about the fact that our generation has everything, I've still got broken guttering, which I'm sure uh, my grandparents <laughs> had that just fine. Um, and, and yeah, and just uh, we seemed like a generation that always whined but didn't really have much to whine about. And, and I figured be, being part of that, you know, not trying to say that I was kind of stood, stood outside of that, being part of that, I thought it would be interesting to follow the journey of somebody who kind of tried to rail against uh, the kind of the issues that his generation faced but still couldn't help being part of them um, and just to kind of watch their journey um, as they tried to kind of find themselves without being all hippy dippy and um, to try and become a better person really. 
Um, it, it's set in the world of PR because um, it, it's easy for me to write that because that's, you know, I've spent the last 10 plus years doing that every day and most nights. Um, and I, I wouldn't really know what a train driver does all day. Well, I assume he drives trains, but it's tough for me to have that, that background detail. Um, so the, the guy that I works in PR. I wanted to ask you about that because the central character is called Bill McDare and he works for a PR firm and you're the director of a PR firm. He's uh, he's a little bit younger than you are, but he's um, he's not much younger. Um, uh, how much is he based on you? Um, I think that he's based... I, I tried to kind of make him like an everyman for, for the generation that I felt that I was part of. Um, he's a similar age to me because I wanted to write to people of my generation. He does a similar job to me, although completely on steroids, um, <laughs> because because it's an industry that I know, but also an industry that I feel is kind of interesting to the general public. You know, and if Bill McDare was an accountant, it maybe wouldn't have that that same appeal that it does because he works in the world of PR, which. Um, I think to people outside of the world PR, of PR, and with the kind of the manifestations we've seen of it in the media, or kind of in, in entertainment media over the past couple of years, with kind of you know the thick of it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it, it feels like an appealing industry. I think um, there are uh, the kind of the similarities with Bill uh, are all cosmetic, really, as opposed to going any any further than that. There are a few things in the book which. Details, which are details from the life I'd lived, which were too good not to put in, um, and, and this isn't giving anything away. Uh, he he lives in a house and has a hole in his bathroom floor, which goes through to the kitchen. And I did live in a house which had a hole in the bathroom floor, which went through to the kitchen, and that and that's just seemed like too much of a just a ridiculous way to be living when you were working quite a serious job in your twenties and rented a room off a couple. It, it just seemed too ridiculous, really, not to have in there. He, um, he has a kind of, kind of moment of awakening when he's um, doing a group spin class, no pun intended, with his colleagues one lunchtime. Me and my colleagues used to, used to do spin together at lunchtime. So there are, there are kind of cosmetic details, uh, which are things that I've done or things that have happened to me. And he's a guy of a similar age and he's doing a similar job to me. But the, the kind of the similarities and the, you know, is it any kind of stuff there really? And, and I think, um, but it's certainly something that I was aware of having to face when it, when it came out. But I think that, you know, good cops can write about bad cops uh, and it doesn't make them a bad cop. Uh, and, and that was the kind of the, the approach I took to it really. If, if I based him on myself, um, it just wouldn't be as interesting as, as if it was Billy who has all these kind of existential problems through the haze of drink and drugs on a daily basis and then, yeah, go out like once a month is really fun. <laughs> it just wouldn't make for as good a story. But I felt the world I was in, if I, if I imagined that as it could be, as the worst that it was, that that would make a really interesting kind of backdrop for this story. And, and you do paint a pretty damning picture of PR. Uh, mm. Bill's characteriz characterization of it's very damning. Uh, PR world is Satan's gang. It's full of mor morally reprehensible individuals. Um, is is becoming an author a bid to escape the world of PR for you? Um, I, I mean, I love I love what I do. I mean, PR in my job. I've done it for, like I say, ten or so years, and it's not, you know, it's not just a, a nine to five for me. I, I kind of really get off on helping people and do stuff over and above the day job, but like I say, like a good cop can tell a, a bad cop story, I can see that there are quite, quite uh, you know, reprehensible people who manifest themselves as PRs or that the industry, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't name names or companies, but something made me laugh just when I was stuck in traffic driving home, a response to a London PR firm who asked for a... Um, an apology from a Middle Eastern magazine uh, because one of their clients had um, uh, been linked with, with ISIS and the Middle Eastern magazine posted a really, really funny response that said to it that anyone who, you know, had 
General Pinochet or Ralph Harris as their clients. <laughs> you know, they really apologise, but you know, maybe actually there was a bit of a bigger problem with these people in the first place. Um, and that's not really my experience of PR. I, you know, in, in the main, I've kind of generally done PR for non-nefarious purposes. You know, I've worked on third sector stuff, charity stuff, whiskies, rugby teams, football teams, sporting associations building societies, you know, there, there is controversial stuff in there at times, um, but it's, it's not screwing over people that often, <laughs> controversial stuff. But I, I figured that that happens in my industry, um, and I didn't see that it was my job, um, through fiction, to, to kind of paint PR as Hey, we're not all bad. It didn't really seem that that was that, that was the job I had to do through fiction. I figured that I could do that do that through work, and I didn't really think that that would be something that would be particularly interesting. You must have colleagues who've read the book and have tried to find themselves in some of the characters that you've painted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it happens in your description of the world of PR. Yeah, I mean, it happens. It happens all the time. I think um, it was something that really, really bothered me as the book was getting closer to publication and um, colleagues clients and the wider industry um, and then you and then I, I kind of told myself that um, well if people take offense um, and if people didn't want to work with me because of this then maybe they weren't the type of people that I wanted to work with anyway and I needed to kind of reassess the options of what I was doing with my career and um, and still, assuming that it would be a career in PR, um, and in the main, it's um, it's been received really well. I think because people who work as I do in the industry know that there could be that bad side to it, and maybe they don't do it, but they can that it actually amuses them to to see that played out in fiction. Because while there have been a couple of manifestations, as I said recently. Malcolm Tucker, I think Stephen Fry was in a PR sitcom. It hasn't been that much. You know, we haven't had what the world of advertising has had fictionalized on TV and in, in books. So I kind of hoped that it would be almost nice for people in PR to, even though they're a right bunch of bastards <laughs> in the agency that Bill works at, that they would kind of get off on seeing the world that they kind of inhabit kind of played out in a kind of on steroids version in front of them. Um, that's the colleague side of it. The client side of it was perhaps more worrying because you know you wonder if clients would read it and think, oh Christ, is this what is this what really happens or is is this what they really think of us or is this what it's really like? Um, there was a lot of editing <laughs> to get to get to where it was to when you kind of went through and thought, okay, maybe I shouldn't say that. Let's say this instead. Um, and I kind of, you know, there were a few book launches, and there was one in London and one in Cardiff. And the one in Cardiff had maybe 15 clients there um, who all bought the book and all read the book, and the feedback's been great. There's only one client who said, kind of halfway through, or, you know, a third of the way through, I was thinking, Christ, I wonder if we can work with that anymore. Uh, and by the end of it, she was crying uh, because of the, the kind of the transformation the character goes on. So. Yeah, it was a real concern, um, but it, I kind of steeled myself for it. And in fairness, um, you know, it's it's been okay so far. But when you stick your chin out, I think sometimes you've got to you've got to expect to be uh, knocked knocked down. I think. Um, Russell Goldsmith, who is uh, who is one of our live viewers uh, and who I also happen to know. Uh, is an author himself, although I think he's uh, written uh, a business book. Uh, wants to know how long it took you to write it. Um, hi Russ. Um, so from the, the kind of the, the gestation of the idea through to the um, kind of the pen going on paper and, and then the, the book coming out, uh, which I have here. I've got the last few first editions here actually. Um, we're kind of just about sold out, so we're, we're kind of printing the second edition. I've, I've got one here too. Ah, brilliant! <laughs> there we go. Collector's editions, these. Um, it was about six years, all told, and um, that was, which maybe included 
in that period, about two and a half years or two years of really going for it for us, um, and uh, a couple of years at the beginning of fannying around and not really knowing what I was doing with it. And the kind of the turning point was um, I, every year in my New Year's resolutions, there would be things like stop smoking, um, visit three new countries, um, and make sure you write a thousand words a week on the book. Um, you know, for two, three years, that kind of fell by the wayside, probably by about the 8th of January. Um, and one year, I kind of decided, because a colleague had been on a script writing course at Cardiff Uni, um, and I'd, I'd seen that they did a, um, a novel writing course. It was a 10-week course um, on a Friday morning, two hours, and, and then it was started in January, so it kind of fitted in with my New Year's resolution. Um, so I just took the time off work, kind of went along to that, and then when that was in my diary, the kind of 10 consecutive weeks, writing no the novel then became something that I did. So I, I think most most tasks are, are just about routine, really. Then it became the routine, and from there it made it two, two years hard at it. Yeah, long time. Uh, you've described the writing process as hard work, but did you did you enjoy it at all? Did you actually find it fun? Yeah, yeah. I think it's an it's um it's an it's an escape, but it, it's also a, um, a creative outlet, and also uh, because of this, the style of the book, which is different to some stuff I'm kind of follow ups that I'm writing, and um, it's kind of first person narrative. <laughs> I almost had to have a part of my brain which was always Bill and that would always be thinking like Bill to come up with kind of things that Bill would say or ways that Bill would react in, in situations to always have him on so I could always be who knows where I would be you know whether or not I'd be in the middle of a meeting with a client or on the bus or on the train or you know having a sandwich or ordering a coffee you know, Bill would say something to me, and you'd be like, oh, there he is again, you know, and, and you need to you need to get that down. So, yeah, it became kind of e easier to write when it's just kind of one character because they can kind of in inhibit your brain. But, yeah, it's fun, it's hard work, um, but it, it's ultimately really, really re rewarding and quite surreal, I think. Um, and from, from anything I've ever done, it's, it's had the best payoff, you know. We all do, we, we all work hard. <laughs> Uh, in whatever field it is, and, and often, certainly in PR, um, the payoff's minimal because you know you work hard for people who, uh, for a client or whoever that is, who always hoped that that would happen anyway, and then maybe takes the credit internally, or you work hard on a pitch and you never get it, and you don't get the feedback, you, you feel that you should have deserved to, you know, well why didn't we get that? Because we spent all week, uh, you know, thinking of that 24/7 and preparing. And there's never often the payoff because you're always on to the next thing. Whereas with this, the majority of the fun has been in having the book in, in the hand and, and then it going out in the world and getting to do stuff like this and getting to do the Hay Festival and getting to do launches and sign-ins. And, but it then is part of you and, and something that you do. So you're not just PR person, fan type, you're author and PR person, fan type, or vice versa, and but it's something that, you know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, it, it'll always be there, I suppose. So that's that's the fun part. Um, but there are, you know, there, there are fun parts in the creation as well. Generally, when you, um, you think you're kind of stuck in a, down a blind alley, um, uh, plot-wise or, or even character-wise sometimes, um, and you just end up somewhere that you completely didn't expect, uh, that's great because it can really just take the story somewhere completely different, which you, uh, the, the planning process that you put in place for this kind of narrative of redemption, which is what the book has. Um, you know, you, you just go somewhere that you completely didn't expect, and then you sit back at the end of the day and you think, "Wow, I've been." You look back at your, it tends to be you look back at your internet search history, and you've googled everything from Pompeii to. Uh, molecular chemistry to uh, <laughs> where in South America does the best coffee beans? And you kind of you, yeah, you've, you've got the internet search history of a polymath. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, you, you never know where, you, where you're going to go, and, and that's fun because you just learn loads of useless stuff about useless things. Really. 
Um, you're from Cardiff, and um, I know you spent quite a bit of time in London as well. And as I was reading in the book, I was trying to work out where it was set. Uh, and at no point do you actually say uh, where yeah. the book set. Does it matter? Yeah, no, it didn't. To me. It was a it was a conscious decision. Um, but kind of thinking, being on PR here, thinking back to my objective <laughs> of writing a kind of tale of redemption for the, the every man uh, from, from the millennial generation or generation Y. Um, I wanted it to be set in a kind of anywhere city, kind of an anywhere metropolis, um, which would be as relevant if you lived in Wales, if you lived in England, or if you lived in the States or Australia, or, you know, hopefully when these kind of translation rights come through. Um, it, it, was a, it was a conscious decision. To, to do that, um, yeah, and people are trying to guess where places are, but they're nowhere places really. Which, in some ways, it's kind of a comment on cities and towns across the UK at the moment as well. You know, there's a few hints at times at city centre development that uh, Bill goes to help out in or kind of walks through, which they kind of allude to the fact that his firm had helped clients make the city look that way, but it, it's a bit bland, so it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's nowhere and, and it's meant to be. And this, um, the book's got um, sex, drugs, and I think a little bit of rock and roll from memory as well. Um, why no football? Yeah, I mean, everyone was, everyone was expecting him to be a big Cardiff City fan and to, to really, um, yeah, football to be a big part of it, but it, it just wasn't this time. Um, and I think probably because I'd started to write a... Um, uh, a football book before this, actually, which I've forgotten about until you just asked me, which was called 23 Tales of Love, Life and Cardiff City FC, which was um, one of those kind of hackneyed, uh, a kind of a year in the season, a season in the life of a Cardiff City fan thing, which actually always get published and do quite well because fans of that team buy it. Um, and I figured that it would be a really easy way to write a book because all you'd have to do was write 2,000 words, or no, 3,000 words it was, about each of these 23 games, and voila, end of the season, you had a 70,000 word book, which, you know, great. Um, and it kind of fell down because we had like three home games in a week, and I just didn't get around to doing it. So yeah, football was off the agenda for this one. But, um, yeah, and isn't involved in. I mean, yeah, isn't involved in anything I'm writing at the moment either. But yeah, it'll come back because it's, uh, yeah, it's a big, big passion. Are you uh, are you writing another novel? Mm, yeah, I'm writing two at the moment. So I've been really indecisive. Um, yeah, two, and they're, they're both they're both um, they're both really different from each other, and they're both really different from Half Plus Seven as well. And will you finish them both? Um, yeah, it, it's it's. Basically, I was I was doing one uh, which is called Synchronicity, um, which is kind of based on around the theory of Carl Jung's theory of synchronicity, um, which to put that in Google Hangout terms is if you haven't someone you haven't thought about for ages, you think of and then they tweet you that day, <laughs> or you like bump into them in the shops, which happens a lot to me and it happens a lot to every time I mention it to people, people are like, yeah, that you know, that happens. And is that you know, the kind of are there forces of play which aren't just chance and, and randomness there. Um, so it's the, the one of them is kind of a love story based around that but told through the voice of four different female narrators. Um, and that's that's hard work when you you've got other things on in your life as well because Whereas you could, with Bill, he would just always be there. With this one, there are four different female narrators, so it's pretty tough to have the being in the queue for a coffee and, oh, right, yeah, they would definitely say this and this would happen because you kind of chop it and change it. So that's at a point where it's going to sit there and be the third novel um, <laughs> when someone buys the film rights for half plus seven and I've kind of got my feet up in on the TV. Uh, and have like all day to do that because it's just too difficult at the moment. So then the other one that I'm writing now is, is a similar way in, probably only like a fifth or a sixth or even a seventh of the way in. Seventh is probably about right. Um, and that one is 
kind of about like loss of love and Wi-Fi signal, basically. So yeah, a, a tale for our times again, and, and it is called Post Hipster, which um, yeah. Um, I'm interviewing you, I guess, um, for the Making Hay blog, which mm. uh, is a hobby of mine. Uh, and you were at the Hay Festival uh, uh, this year. Uh, was it your first time? Uh, it was my first time as a performer, um, although I, I did perform in the bar there the year before. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I've kind of been going a little while. Is Hayes just like an hour or so up the road from Cardiff? So it's uh, it is as a Welshman, a proud Welshman, it's great that the kind of the greatest minds in the world descend on this kind of um, seemingly sleepy, but actually really switched on and happening little little book town and um, in the borders. Um, and it, yeah, it'd been. And, and went last year and saw some great stuff, and then this year I got asked to do it. And it was almost a bit like um, having your first single out and being asked to headline Glastonbury. It seemed slightly undeserved, maybe, um, but but amazing. Um, yeah, so kind of went for the weekend and um, had excitedly bought loads of tickets to see stuff, and then realised that as a performer you get loads of free tickets as well. So ended up. Having loads and loads of tickets, and basically just, uh, I was on the bank holiday Monday, um, and went on the Friday or the when the Saturday morning, and just had kind of three packed days of seeing just all manner of things from Stevie Fry on uh, with Tony Fidel uh, talking about the kind of creation of the iPod to Stevie Fry on Shakespeare. To my girlfriend's a scientist, and all loads of science stuff, which is stuff that I would never usually see, but it's great that that's right next to director of the bridge talking about uh, you know potential new series of the bridge and to be part of that um, to be part of that as a punter is just amazing but to be part of it and to actually get up on stage and have people listen to me which you know, was yeah it was incredible really just yes I'll never forget it. Fantastic. Well, I know the organisers are notoriously secret about uh, who they're billing for the festival, certainly, certainly this far out from next May, but I, I hope we'll see you again uh, there maybe next year or, or, uh, or, or, or certainly sometime in the future. Um, before, we, um, before we started this, um, we had a quick chat just to see if the technology worked, and uh, you mentioned you'd, uh, you'd brushed your teeth, uh, and, uh, and also you were checking out um, uh, what kind of aftershave or cologne. Did you, did you yeah. find one? Um, I, I went for a, I don't know if, if Russ or anyone else who might be watching or yourself can smell this kind of, uh, it's quite musky but, but uh, r robust because it's rainy here. I, generally on a summer's day I'd go for a light summery, you know, maybe even a, maybe even floral kind of uh, scent. But yeah, Cardiff, um, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't look like August out there. So I've gone for a woody, a woody robust scent which hopefully is coming through across those. Uh, airwaves, not airwaves, what would it be called? Um, Dan, I've really enjoyed it. Um, uh, it's the first time uh, I've done a Google Hangout for Making Hay, or indeed for any other purpose, certainly a live one. Um, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, what's really fascinating to me is somebody who works in TV PR. I've been watching the audience. The audience figures are quite low in comparison to a TV pro program, but our audience retention has been absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> So, so uh, if you're if you've been watching it, thanks for thanks for sticking with it. Um, uh, Dan's book is called Half Plus Seven. You can get it on Amazon. Is that the best place to get it? Amazon, good bookshops. Um, Amazon, good bookshops. Uh, direct from the publisher's website. The publisher's called Parthian. Um, we're kind of <coughs> there's a handful of first editions to the left. So, uh, if anyone's kind of watching, now's the time to go and get one of those. Um, because yeah, they're, they're on their way out, and there's a second edition coming out now in September. But it doesn't look as good. There's no kind of, it's just a, it's just a book. Whereas the first edition's got really cool French leaves and lots of other kind of whiz bangy, nice bit of it. Yeah, I've loved it, and there it is. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> yeah, and just, just, just a word really to the, the guy who designed the cover was a guy called Jack Hudson, who uh, is a friend who, who kind of does lots of design for Google and. Time magazine and Guardian and Oprah magazine and um, yeah, I think um, it's really important to to get the cover right to, to make it stand out, even if what's inside is nonsense. So yeah, Watson sounds great. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks, Rob. I loved it.
Bye. Yeah,